you for joining us first of all. Um, welcome to the Medics in Academia event brought to you by the Kamala Academics. So a bit about ourselves, I'm Nasra Abshir, I'm a fifth year medical student um, hoping to pursue academic uh, medicine. And Hi, my name is uh, Maimoun and I'm also a fifth year medical student with uh, an interest in uh, research. So we're just going to introduce Somali Academics <coughs> So Somali Academics is a student-led non-profit organization that focuses on bridging the gap between the Somali community and academia. Our mission is to elevate the pursuits of higher education within our community and to create a community of like-minded professionals all with a common goal of empowering our youth. Um, the collective desire to pursue further education within our community is reflected in the popularity of our PhD Insight Days um, event, basically, which motivated us to formally set up Somali Academic. We organized uh, this PhD Insight Day where we went through application processes and what a PhD program entails and um, independent research conferences and publications and so on. Um, Somali Ac Academics was formally set up following this event based on the positive feedback that we received. And please tune in until the end, where we will share some exciting news about this year's upcoming PhD in Day. So since our formation, we have rapidly grown in popularity and have hosted various large virtual events. Both, um, so we've done two virtual events so far, both of which were in the format of a webinar series called Beyond Academia. We need to consisted of talks from several high profile people. So the first one that you see was explored um, explored the current influential Somali professionals within our communities and across different sectors. They discussed the key practical skills that they developed and provided invaluable advice tailored to their respective skills. For the second one, we collaborated with Fail Forward Hub, and this one was geared more towards lead leadership, and we also brought out several high-profile professionals who discussed their leadership roles across both public and private sectors. And this brings us to today's event, which is Medics in Academia. And we're basically here to kickstart your journey of research and give you all the tips and tricks required in order to succeed in the world of research. And we are joined by an esteemed um, panel of medical researchers, uh, each with their own impressive journeys. And we'll begin with Dr. Jem Shade, who is an academic junior doctor, followed by Dr. Lynn Asante Asari, a PhD student studying medicine, and finishing off with Dr. Zakir Ashkir, who is a cardiologist going out of program to pursue a PhD. Each talk will be around 20 minutes and there will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. So please uh, stay tuned. And some general housekeeping rules, uh, this webinar is recorded. If you have any questions, you can submit it in the um, Zoom question box or via Twitter uh, using the hashtag Medic in Academia. There is a Q&A session uh, and an open discussion at the end of the talk, so please stay tuned. And after the webinar, we'll be sending out a survey, uh, so please answer those questions as well as you do. And the slides will be shared on the uh, speaker's description. So, okay, so we'll start off with uh, Dr. Faisal Jamshade. Um, Dr. Faisal Jamshade is currently an academic junior doctor in Essex. He's also a clinical associate lecturer at Anglia Ruskin University and the co-author of the ASP Handbook. He's also founded the Young Academics. And yeah, we will let Dr. Faisal speak a little bit more about him and about, about himself. So without further ado, we'll hand you over to Dr. Faisal. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Thanks, guys. Uh, so yeah, my name is Faisal. I'm an academic foundation program doctor. I'm currently in my second year. Um, so let me just try and get my... Um, presentation up. Just let me know if you can see this. Can you see that? Is it up? Okay, perfect. So um, I've been given the task of talking to you, uh, giving you a very brief masterclass, I would say, on researching at medical school as a medical student. Okay. Now this presentation was initially like a 40 minute lecture that I'd previously given. But I've tweaked it and I've kind of like condensed it down a little bit. And I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. So I'm trying to, uh, if I start to overrun, just give me a little wave or something. Um, as we wind down towards the end, okay? And also just throw any questions you want um, in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Um, okay, so 
I like to keep my presentation very simple. Okay, so firstly, what is the point of researching? Why be strategic? Why not just let things happen as you go along? Who, who is it good to work with? Should you do it alone? Should you do it with a supervisor? Should you do it with your friends, etc.? When should you get involved in research? As you know, medical school can be four years up to six, seven years, sometimes longer. Um, and so obviously, as a preclinical student, as a clinical student, as someone who might be doing an integrated BSc or uh, integrated master's degree, there's different opportunities and different experiences that you've had. Um, and so it's good to tailor that towards the different opportunities that you go for. Okay. And finally, I'll just be touching a bit on about um, different tips and tricks that I've learned along the way from making a lot of mistakes and sort of having, you know, the worst experiences and the best experiences, and now being very involved in helping other students to actually achieve uh, and secure research projects through young academics, okay? So firstly, what is the point, okay? Now, the majority of medical students know that vaguely that when you do research, you get points, you, you know, you bulk up your portfolio, you make your CV look a little bit better. Now that comes in the form of presentations, oral posters, sorry, just posters, um, and publications, awards, etc. Okay, all of these things look really good on your CV, on your portfolio. And even if that doesn't really entice you, almost every medical student uh, might know a little bit about the Foundation Program Application System, stands for FPAS. If you're in your first or second year, you may not have heard of this yet, but essentially the FPAS is a system through which every medical student in the UK applies to a Foundation Program training. That means your F1 and your F2 years, okay? And one of the criteria that gives you points during this FPAS system, application system, is that you can get up to two points for publications, okay? Now, these are publications that have a unique PubMed code, meaning that they've been indexed on that PubMed website, which you can, most of you have probably seen. You get one point for each publication, and so the maximum you can get is two points, okay? Now, just to put in perspective how, how, how much two points actually means, a master's degree will give you four points. So if you get two publications, that's equivalent to half a master's degree. If you get a first class honors in a uh, bachelor's degree or integrated BSc, that is also four points. So you're getting half of that just for getting two points, uh, two publications, okay? And also that, that's equivalent to you being pushed up two deciles within your cohort, your year, year, year rank, okay? So it does mean a lot. Okay, and not only that, but the AFP stands for Academic Foundation Program, which is another entry into the foundation program, but it gives you some dedicated time to do some research, usually about four months uh, in your F2 year. It's currently what I'm doing. My one isn't actually four months, it's integrated throughout my entire F2 year. They give, they let me work uh, at like 60% of the usual clinical time. So that 40% of the time during the year is dedicated for my independent academic research, okay? And there's loads of benefits about that. You can, you know, there's plenty of resources which I'll touch on some at the end. But for the academic foundation program, there's the criteria allows for a lot more posters, presentations, awards. So those who are thinking about an academic career should really have a think about this, have a look at the academic foundation program. It's a big topic, so I'm not going to cover it here, but just to be aware of. Okay. Not only that, but when you're applying for your future specialty training posts, whether you're going for a GP, cardiology, surgery. Having research under your belt is a massive differentiating factor for whichever specialty training program you go into, okay? Now, when you go for your interviews on paper, this is usually like a massive differentiating factor for you and your uh, competitors, okay? And you will never have as much time as you do now as a medical student to get stuck in, to learn the nitty gritty, to, to find out what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy, to learn the basic skills and to sort of figure out how it, what it's like to work with good supervisors, okay, and build a good network. Um, so networking with researchers is something that I feel like medical students are really downplay. It's something that we don't actively kind of feel like, you know, we're gaining much from it. But realistically, I never saw, I never saw how important that was until my fourth year, which I'll come back to a little bit later. This is my integrated BSc year. I made a really good extensive network um, just because of the situations that I was in. And I've worked really hard to build good relationships. And those good relationships with these academics, sort of, I was sort of reaping the rewards later down the line. And even now, there are so many opportunities that are open to me as a result of having met and worked with and successfully published with or presented with some of these academics, okay? And so, yes, you can reap rewards later down the line if you make a good network now. 
And finally, travel internationally for free if you get reimbursed. Uh, this is like one of my favorite things about researching and being involved in research is that research conferences and sharing your research happens all the time year round in whatever sort of uh, field or specialty you're doing it in. Um, you can apply for conferences nationally, internationally. And as a medical student, most medical schools have conference uh, sort of reimbursement schemes or opportunity funds. Uh, I know as a King's medical student, I used to go um, for, for the very few uh, posters and presentations I went and presented at, I actually was able to re get properly reimbursed for the flights, accommodation, the conference fees, etc. And so essentially you get to travel for free, which a lot of researchers know is a major perk of you know getting involved in novel research. So why be strategic? Why not just why not just let things happen as they come along? Why not just jump on opportunities as as they come to you? The whole point is that you should six years is a long time, okay? And obviously there's, there's a lot of stories about students and um, medical students just being messed around by supervisors, not feeling as if, you know, the work they put in was appropriately rewarded in, in the form of, you know, being, uh, you know, an author. I've had that experience myself. I put a lot of work in in my second year for a project, which um, I was promised my name would go on. Little did I know I hadn't clarified exactly where my name would go. And my name went in the acknowledgements of the paper right at the end. So I wasn't actually an author, which I thought I would be. And so that kind of annoyed me, it annoys a lot of people. It actually puts a lot of people off academia. But I promise you that if, if you take control of your research experience and you know, uh, you know how essentially to communicate with your supervisors, how to sort of lay the groundwork for what you want to get out of a research project, you can save a lot of time and energy throughout your time at medical school. Secondly, maximize output. So when I first started medical school, I thought one or two publications was a massive feat. I mean, like universities and medical schools largely don't give a very, they're not very structured in the way they teach us about academia. They're not very transparent. It's largely, hey, go off and do it on your own. Learn for yourself if you like it, good. Uh, if you don't, uh, it's not really our fault. Okay, that's the sort of stance that most universities take with academia. I feel like they could do it a lot better. Some of my friends actually at some point in my medical school um, sort of journey, I realized that they were on 10, close to 20 publications. And I was like, wow, like they, these guys have, or girls have literally just set the, you know, a higher bar, a higher standard. And as soon as I saw that that sort of thing was possible as a medical student, I realized, you know what, one or two publications isn't actually the bar anymore. Now it's 10 or 20. So getting three, four, five is, is not as difficult as people make it out to be if you have a strategy. Thirdly, truly benefit from your work. Okay, by this, I mean, I, I personally was not just interested in getting points and just finding shortcuts and hacks to get, you know, bulk up my portfolio without actually learning the ins and outs of how I was doing that research, okay? I just, I didn't want to be, you know, sort of sitting there on a computer doing data collection for 10 hours a day just to get rewards. I wanted to do literature searches. I wanted to critically appraise. I wanted to, you know, draft a manuscript. I wanted to learn the skills so that later on I could be confident that I knew how to do it on my own, okay? And so in that way, you have to be strategic in how you communicate with your supervisors, how you communicate what you want to get out of projects. And finally, working with supervisors is actually a very strategic thing, okay? Um, it's a lot about, I'll come to it on the next slide, but essentially you, a bad supervisor or a bad supervisor student relationship can actually drain your energy, it can drain your time, it can mean that you've wasted a lot of effort and got zero rewards out of it, or it could be the complete opposite. You can have a supervisor who, you know, motivates you, who helps you get the most out of your work, who actually encourages you to get into opportunities where you know you're going to get something out of it, like posters, publications, etc. So the spectrum is pretty, it's pretty large, okay? So it's sort of down to us to figure out, okay, this person is not a good match. How do I work towards someone who is a better match? And how do I stick with them? How do I communicate with them? How do I hold on to them? So that brings me on to who exactly should you work with to do to do your research projects, okay? Now, firstly, almost every medical student will have a side project or some sort of project allocated to them by, by the university, okay? And I call this an arranged project, okay? Meaning that the supervisor is usually being paid to supervise you and overlook your project. And vice versa, you as a medical student need to actually submit something to the college or university so that you get a grade and you pass your year, okay? So these two forces are sort of pushing you together to work. And so it's a great opportunity for you to actually capitalize on that and sort of try and get something out of it because you know that the supervisor is not going anywhere and you're not going anywhere. You have to get that project done together. 
okay so but obviously the downside of this is that you a lot of the time you are given a project that you might not enjoy you have a supervisor who you don't really get along with and that brings me on to the next sort of more more risky sort of uh, arrangement but so the upsides in this um, arrangement are you know the upsides can be much higher but also the lows can be you know very low so independently organizing projects yourself or finding a supervisor can actually find you an amazing supervisor you could find you you know like the best experience ever but it involves a bit of speed dating sort of okay and now obviously with speed dating the concept is that you you wouldn't go and marry the first person that you you find or you date okay you want to sort of see you know see who's out there who's the best for you who's the best match for you who you're going to get the most from okay now the majority of medical students the first supervisor that they see or cling on to uh largely sometimes this will usually be a bad match okay and now these sort of you know partnerships can last six months seven months a year and you're essentially wasting your time if you're in a partnership which isn't very beneficial for either of you okay and so the sooner you can start you know figuring out whether or not someone is right for you and say you know what i think i might pass on this opportunity the sooner you can start to open up time for partnerships which can you can actually benefit from okay thirdly i would say working with friends and other students is beneficial is better than working alone because it's obviously better to leverage the help of a team rather than do everything alone a project that could take a year alone might take a couple months with your friends or other students the problem is working with your friends can open you up to arguments could open you up to you know uh, people not pulling their weight and that causes complications in, you, in your sort of personal life okay so i wouldn't re really recommend doing it with friends unless you know for certain that you can um like you're willing to put more the most work in in the group okay I, I, there's a saying in like business which is never get involved in a team if you're you're not willing to put in the majority of the work okay and i think that's really true also you can also just uh you know approach other students who you think are really smart who you know are very dedicated ambitious and you if you approach them you, that's a form of networking as well that's a way that you can actually you know start working with people who you sort of admire and you want to work with just by reaching out and saying look i'm motivated to get this project done do you want to help me okay finally working on a project alone i generally don't recommend this unless number one you've got experience in doing a certain type of project multiple times over if you've done five literature searches for example or sorry literature reviews for example and you want to do a sixth one and you've done it before previously that's fine go for it otherwise you can also uh, as a solo medical student can actually reach out to supervisors consultants and ask them to consult you independently that would usually involve you going up to a clinician or academic and saying look i've got a project in mind i would you mind watching over me you don't have to babysit me because i am very ambitious uh, i'm very dedicated to getting this done and uh, i'm basically going to work my ass off to get it done okay you say something like that to any supervisor they're thinking okay this person is going to carry themselves i just have to overlook them a little bit it's not going to be a problem okay when to get involved how, how am i doing for time guys five minutes okay i'll try and wrap it up quickly so when to do it so pretty pre-clinical years i would advise get involved in whatever you can um obviously it's difficult to be picky when you're just starting off get involved but at the same time don't get pushed around don't be given a uh, project which is unfair to you state from the beginning look this is what i want to get out of the project i want to get a poster or or presentation uh, and if possible i would like to work towards publication is it possible for me to change the title towards getting this out of my project okay and usually supervisors really respect when you know what you want otherwise if you don't know what you want they will impose what they want which is generally you to get the work done and move on okay during your clinical years you've got a lot more access to clinical work clinicians are usually doing very quick projects alongside their um their commitments so obviously there's a lot more different opportunities there in that way and you can work with you can, as a medical student, you've got free pass to go to any department and say, look, do you have a project? I'd like to work with you. The Integrated BSc and MSc is an amazing opportunity. That's what I personally did the Integrated BSc. It, I get gained the majority of my publications and posters all from projects during this year. It meant that I didn't have to focus so much on my clinical commitments and just focus on this. Okay, so I'd highly recommend looking up uh, Integrated BSc or MSc. 
starting a new project. Okay, so I'm going to cover these two points together. So the majority of medical students usually have at some point done a research project, which they haven't really done much with. I mean, they've done it, they've submitted it to a, you know, the college, but they haven't actually made a poster out of it. They haven't presented it. They haven't worked towards publication. What you can do with any essay that you've previously done is look up a conference online, which is related to that essay, break it down, summarize it into an abstract and submit it. If you do it properly, if you uh, have a look at some of the previous abstracts that have been submitted to that conference and just submit it, go through the motions, I guarantee you, you will get accepted at one or the other for a past project. That means squeezing the juice out of old projects. But starting a new project, I would highly recommend do not take an old project to 80% and then drop it and go to another, start a new one. Because a lot of students, I feel like they're kind of scared of taking it to that, you know, that last 100%. It's very difficult. It's the unknown for most of us, okay? I had that same problem but work towards getting old projects finished. Okay, and my final slide is how to do it. Okay, so contact people, LinkedIn, Twitter, ResearchGate, find their emails online, find their secretaries, contact them and just say, look, this is, I'm very keen, I wanna get this done. You don't have to babysit me. As long as you convey that message, people are more than happy to work with you. I mean, at the end of the day, you're working for free to help them as well. Their names will go on those publications. Why wouldn't they help you? Don't give them the reason not to. Find them in person. Uh, as medical students, you have free reign to go wherever you want in the hospital. Ask friends to collaborate, as I mentioned before, um, is always a good way to leverage the help of a team to you know, save your time. And also it really doesn't matter whether or not your first author, or second author, just get your name on it, okay? And ask old supervisors. So if you build up good relationships with previous supervisors, you can sort of reap the rewards. Ask them, do you have any other projects? And some, some of my uh, some of my friends who had so many publications actually got most of them from one supervisor or two supervisors, okay? And last but not least, as I mentioned, finish your old projects, okay? So here's a couple of resources which I just wanted to share with you. This is probably, the top link is a link to um, the BMA library. If you're a BMA member as a medical student, if you're first year, you can get for free. Otherwise, it costs about £20, maybe £30 a year. You can get that basically back in printing credits, which is basically what I did, uh, which I printed all my notes off. But also there's an amazing lady, I think her name is Helen or something. She can actually um, craft an entire literature search for you if you tell her which databases to search and what your topic is on. She can also, I mean, during COVID it's probably not worth running, but I actually sat down with her for an hour workshop where she literally broke down how to do a comprehensive literature search for a systematic review. And then she gave me the file for me to import into my reference software, okay? So just Google that, BMA Library Literature Search Help. It's an amazing service. Um, my, uh, I have a startup called Young Academics, which is helping to find uh, students uh, research projects, just like you know some of the problems that we're facing. I'm also writing some uh, articles on medium.com. You can search that up. I've also recently published a Skillshare class, which is like, if you sign up, you can basically watch uh, a class for free. Um, it's about how to present your research conferences from beginning to end, okay? Finally, if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A. You can email me here. If you'd like to keep up with what I, some of the things I do, I have a new YouTube channel, uh, a weekly blog, social media links, etc. Feel free to just, I think everything is sort of crammed onto my website there. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jamshid. You gave us a lot of uh, food for thought, covered a lot of topics. <laughs> I did squeeze a lot in, yeah. I hope that's okay. As um, the future doctors ourselves, I was very... That was, um, that was very impressive. Thank you so much. No worries. Our next speaker, Dr. Lin, is a visiting scientist at the Ca uh, Cancer Research in C Cambridge Institute. Uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Cambridge after uh, finishing her bachelor's at the University of Warwick. And she's also a medical student at the uh, University of Leicester. So uh, Dr. Lin, do you want to take it away? Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, so my talk is going to be a bit different. So this is really going to be a little bit of a break. So, you know, you can put your notepads down. This is going to be me sharing uh, my journey going into medicine um, after I did uh, a PhD um, and how I came to that decision. So hopefully there may be um, sort of the target audience are PhDs, PhD students or postdocs um, who are considering making this move. So that's that's who my talk is geared at, but hopefully those of you who are medics and are interested in academia, there'll be some things that I'm going to say that will hopefully sort of spark your passion as to why it's really cool to, to combine the two. 
So as has been said already, um, I have uh, done my PhD already and I'm now a visiting scientist uh, in the Molecular Imaging in Cancer Laboratory. Uh, this is at the University of Cambridge and this just means um, I'm not there full time anymore, I'm there part time continuing uh, the research that I did as a PhD student um, and at the moment that's effectively um, publishing, publishing our work. So my journey uh, going into a PhD first of all was quite a straightforward one um, and a personal one. So when I was um, 18 I, I lost my best friend to cancer, he had leukaemia um, and I made the decision then, it was a very easy one, I said I want to do science, I want to um, maybe uh, become a postdoc one day um, and maybe have my own lab um, and so I didn't go into it with um, the view of going into medicine, I was very sort of tunnel vision on um, getting as much cancer research experience Experience as I could as an undergraduate student um, and that's what I did and so after my BSc um, I didn't do a master's I went straight on to my PhD um, and I've been um, in this lab um, since. So in terms of now talking about the high sort of the highlights where medicine started to creep in, um, the first would be um, supporting Cancer Research UK, who um, are my funding body uh, with a project called Sponsor uh, a PhD Researcher. So this is just a screenshot from their website and this scheme was really to help patients engage with their researchers. So as some of you, I'm sure you're aware, academia can be very, very detached and very isolated. We're sort of in the lab with cells and proteins and actually the people who support our work never really know what we're doing uh, to, to help them. So this scheme was to try and bridge that, that connection so patients and families can feel more connected uh, with us. Um, so I was one of the students who was picked for this scheme. There was four of us in total and it was a very sort of very enjoyable um, project to be part of and it just meant about three or four times a year we would write a letter to patients and families and we would just describe basically everything um, that we were doing and what I found is that my my letters were very research focused so even though the big picture was that I'm helping cancer patients actually on a day-to-day -day basis all I had to say was I was in the lab I've been growing cells the experiment didn't work but I hope it will work eventually um, I've published this I've gone to a conference and actually I felt a bit detached uh, that everything I was doing was hope I was hoping it would help them but I didn't think that I was connected uh, with them um, enough so that was uh, towards the end of my first year that I started to get those first sort of uh, uh, feelings of, mm, I'm not quite sure I'm on the right side of healthcare here. So some of the things that I did was to just try and start engaging uh, with um, patients and the hospital community. Again, not with any sort of um, direction to go into medicine in the end, but just to make sure that I'm really in touch with the big picture of where my research is going. So some of the things I did um, was uh, I got some qualifications in British Sign Language um, and started volunteering with the Cambridge Deaf Association. And I also joined Macmillan Cancer Care as one of their volunteers. Um, and so about three hours a week, I would be in the oncology department, um, helping patients with uh, getting benefits. Um, sometimes they would just come and have a good cry. Sometimes we'll look at recipes after chemotherapy. Um, a whole a whole bunch of things um, that was really really good fun. On top of that, I was also a supervisor. So if you're familiar with teaching undergraduates in Cambridge, that's done with supervision. So I was a supervisor for biochemistry, cancer, and diabetes um, for first year uh, medical students and veterinary students. So by the by the time I was in the middle of my second year, medicine was sort of feeding in, not just through teaching, but through my sort of volunteer work. And also I now had loads of colleagues um, by being um, a teacher on the medicine and veterinary course who were also medics too, um, who would share you know, with me about, about their career. Um, so as I've said, the more I started engaging with Macmillan and doing my sign language and volunteering and teaching, I then, Become, became more aware of this difference uh, between the bench and the bedside, which is just what this slide is showing, that where I was, was here with the mice and with the microscopes and with the tubes and the mixing and the pets. Um, and actually what people thought I was doing <laughs> in terms of helping cancer patients with my research was the other side, which is helping their symptoms and helping their treatments. And actually uh, I couldn't do any of that. I could. I can tell you sort of the molecular biology of why you have cancer and I can probably tell you the name of some proteins, BRCA1, BRCA2, I'm sure all of you will remember that, and that's linked to why you have it. 
But in the moment, if you ask me, what can I physically do now uh, to support you? The answer would be, um, I can't do anything actually. Um, and so that was uh, one of the uh, major concerns I began to have um, at the end of the second year of, of my PhD um, that I think I would like um, to, do, to do more. So sharing this uh, with a close friend of mine who's um, a gastroenterology reg now, but at the time she was doing her core medical training um, and she was uh, in the process of deciding whether to go into research and I was in the process of deciding whether to go into, into medicine. So she recommended that we read this book. I'm not I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, but it's called When Breath Becomes Air. It's basically written um, by a neuro a neurosurgeon and he wrote this book when he was diagnosed with advanced uh, lung cancer. And so this book is him sort of looking back on his uh, career in medicine and as, a, as an academic um, and just sharing some reflections that he learned. So some of the quotes that stood out for me was one of the things he says is, but my girlfriend, uh, Lucy, understood the subtext of the academic. So the background for that is him and his girlfriend at the time are revising ECGs um, and she gets very upset to notice that um, one of the ECGs was showing a patient going into cardiac arrest. And he was just focused on learning it because he's going to sit the exam. And she stopped him and said, no, actually there's a subtext here that this isn't just an ECG to learn. This is actually, this, this would have happened to somebody and so that was one of the quotes of just, you know, putting that forward that, you know, when you're doing these academic things, whether that's proteins or cells, there is something behind it. There are people behind it that you're, you're, really, um, you're really trying to help and it's important to always understand and be aware of, of that subtext. Um, and then just another quote that you can read, again, touching on that, that there is, I began to see a clear difference between being a scientist and focusing on the matter and the mechanisms and the theory side of things. And then what you do in medicine, which is a lot more, um, a lot more people, people focused. And so that reading that book, um, the people that I was meeting in, in research, uh, my project being quite clinically focused, um, all began to make it very clear that actually, why do I have to choose? Why can't I uh, teach and also keep doing science and also um, go into clinical practice if I wanted to um, and, still, and, still, and still be a scientist um, as well? Okay. So that was my journey. So just to summarize then, what are the pros of doing uh, medicine after a PhD for, uh, as I said, for those who are um, considering this move? Of course, there are loads of transferable skills that you're going to have. So the things that have been discussed previously, going to conferences, doing posters, presentations, we don't get point for that. That's just what we do. It's just, it's just, your, it's just the job that we do as research scientists, right? So you're gonna go into medicine and you will know how to manage projects and find information and you'll have a bit of maturity as well and working under pressure so that that's super useful and um, you also have an established career and a support network so if you've gone in after medicine you would be a lot older I imagine and so you would have built a lot of your life already and that can be um, really beneficial to support you. Um, I'm not going to cover the training application points because I think that was covered really well um, in the previous talk but you do get points for having publications and, and, and higher degrees um, and, and that can help towards your rankings. Um, of course, a career in clinical academia is probably something you don't have to think too, too deeply uh, about, and that's an option where you can still maintain a lot of the things that you enjoyed about science. And then, of course, there are the benefit, you know, the general benefits of going into medicine, which I won't, I won't go into because you would know. Um, and then the cons of doing medicine after a PhD. Um, of course, you're going to be applying whilst doing science. So if I imagine most of you would have applied during your A-levels, you know how stressful that is, you know, sort of applying and doing the admission test during that. Absolutely no different. You still have to do the personal statement. You have to do the work experience and the admission test. And then on top of that, you're finishing your PhD, submitting papers, et cetera, which was, which was my case. Um, you need to think about the finances. So tuition fees uh, now are £9,250 a year. So just let that sink in and uh, you, can, you can figure out <laughs> of course why that is a is a con um, and then of course you need to think about your other life goals those of us who go into medicine after a PhD are a bit older you might want to start a family you might be thinking about your your friends and your previous colleagues and how to maintain that um, now you're going to be a student for a lot longer and of course you need to find a new support network and fit in with 18 year olds and uh, 24 year olds with graduate medics as well and figure out how to sort of still have a sense of, of, of identity in your new environment so lots to think about. So to end, just my final tips for uh, PhDs considering going into medicine. 
first of all, make sure that you consider uh, what medicine can offer you that research doesn't. You've worked very hard. You're probably a postdoc. You've got publications, probably lots of first author ones. Are you sure that you want to sort of retrain um, and go back in, uh, into medicine? What is it that medicine will give you that you can't achieve by maybe changing your research area or changing your lab? Um, second, do long term people for focus volunteering. So make sure you get into a medical setting. Obviously, the lab um, environment is very different. We work on our own a lot. We're very independent. And yes, we talk, but it's not in the same way as medicine where you're constantly communicating. So make sure that you actually do enjoy being around people. And it's not just that you're frustrated with science and you think that medicine will give you sort of a new window of research, you know, so make sure that you actually are happy, relatively happy in that environment and that working with patients and in a team is something that you want to do. Um, of course, talk to clinical academics, and I say specifically clinical academics because they tend to understand your, your background and will appreciate um, some of the sort of considerations you have in terms of research. And of course, you know how to search the literature, so use your research skills, go online, go on Google, search, literally going into medicine after a PhD, that's what I did. And there'll be loads of profiles and tips um, that will come up. And of course, these are just some books that, that, that I read that, that were really useful to help me decide um, about that. Um, when you're applying, just remember that you still have to meet, uh, meet the requirements um, like everybody else. So there are no benefits to being a postdoc if you don't have the grades, if you've not done the admission tests, if you've not written a personal statement that shows you're truly passionate about medicine. So just make sure that you really put the effort in like everybody else is doing to get that work experience and show your commitment um, to this field. Um, select a medical school based on your life goals, not your career goals. So as I've said, you might be thinking about finances. So maybe think about applying to a med school where you can live at home. So you don't necessarily need to think about, um, I don't know, I wanna go to London when you've already got a PhD, you're okay, sort of academically think about going somewhere that will allow you to maintain the other aspects of your life. So cheap cost of living so that you can save and do, do other things. And then finally, be intentional and deliberate about creating the career and life you want. And all that means is nothing is going to happen by accident. So if you are concerned about when you would have kids or how you're gonna afford it, you do need to plan ahead and talk to people and think about when to save, think about when to have these important discussions um, and, and just really plan ahead for what's coming. So finally, uh, just a final quote from, from the book, which is um, just uh, the author saying that Finally, when he got into the hospital into the, and into the hospital and into the clinics, he was finally putting that theoretical knowledge um, into, into use and it's no longer something abstract. And of course, it's important to note that this is a neurosurgeon who, is, who has written this. Of course, as a medical student, you know that we haven't saved anyone. <laughs> We're still learning proteins and doing a lot of theory stuff, but I'm talking about the big picture, sort of what you're aiming for in the future. And this is something uh, that you really can't do when you're just doing science. But when you put both of them together, both science and medicine, you have that theoretical aspect which is cool and very detailed and very challenging, but at the same time, it's, it's gearing towards helping people. Okay, so thank you for listening to my talk. As I said, this is uh, hopefully you would uh, really consider uh, joining the two uh, and not picking one because they're both amazing and feel free to contact me directly on Twitter uh, and that's my email address as well. Good luck. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. That was really inspiring. It was actually, a really unique perspective because it's not every day that people go from doing a PhD to medicine and mm -hmm. I think that it was really good actually to hear about putting things like the perspective of putting things from theory into practice so that mm -hmm. was great. Please stick around to the end for the Q&A um, so yeah thanks again. Um, next we have Dr Zakaria Ashkir. Um, Dr. Zakir Ashkir is a senior cardiology trainee in London and the founder of the British Somali Medical Association. He's been preparing to go out of program to commence a PhD in cardiovascular imaging and has extensive experience in clinical training and routes into academia for clinicians. So we will hand it over to Dr. Ashkir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, firstly, um, a thank you to Somali Academics for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, my name is uh, Zach Ashkir or Zachary Ashkir. I'm a cardiology registrar in London. And 
uh, I'm, I'm also someone who's planning to go out for research and do a PhD. Um, and I think I'd like to say that uh, some excellent talks from Faisal and from Lynn, and it's very interesting to see Lynn's perspective in particular. It's a very um, uh, interesting uh, pathway that she's taken doing a PhD first and then doing medicine. Um, and a, a lot of things echo, um, a lot of things in my experience have echoed what she said. So going out to do a PhD, hopefully I'll have some transferable skills that I can take with me. Um, but it's equally, uh, equally terrifying experience in some ways, I'd say as well. So uh, here we go. So what I'm hoping to cover is the why, why go out for a PhD, how to go out for a PhD and when to go out for a PhD. And I think the first question that anybody who's thinking about doing a PhD uh, as a medic uh, that they will ask themselves is, you know, why, why on earth would I want to do a PhD? My training is already long enough, you know, five years of medical school and uh, five to 10 years of further training. Why would I want to take out three further years to do research um, and then have to face de-skilling, um, coming back at an older age, um, you know, uh, being paid less and um, being out of my comfort zone. And uh, like many things in life, uh, the reasons for doing a PhD are, are manifold. There are a combination of different things uh, and there is no true one answer, uh, but it's usually uh, a combination of interests, opportunity and uh, career related reasons. So you may have a specific research interest as a clinician, uh, for example, uh, you may be an endocrinologist with interest in diabetes and interest in a particular uh, aspect of, of uh, diabetic therapy or diabetic treatment. Uh, or you may be somebody who, who wants to be an academic clinician and has always wanted to be a clinical scientist. Uh, so if you're one of those people, then a PhD is a must really. You may be wanting to do a PhD to make yourself more competitive uh, for a chosen speciality. For its chosen speciality. Um, that is, I, I think, you know, some people may think that's just being very careerist, but actually I think uh, I personally see it as a valid reason to do a PhD. Um, it, it doesn't take away from the benefits of doing a PhD or from the enjoyments of, of doing a PhD, uh, as long as you stay open-minded and you know what you're uh, signing up for. Uh, for example, in cardiology, um, it's, it's because it's a very research intensive speciality, uh, a higher research degree is more or less expected. Um, uh, so you, you, you know, it's not that you're trying to stand out from the crowd, it's you'll struggle to get a job as a consultant cardiologist if you've not done a research degree, definitely in London uh, and very likely in many other big cities. Uh, and of course, there's also the element of self-development and, uh, and it being a real challenge um, and uh, as medics, we are a bit sadistic. We enjoy torturing ourselves and sort of testing our limits. And, uh, and definitely the idea of uh, developing new skills and, and challenging yourself and your abilities is, uh, is a motivating factor for some in doing their PhD. Uh, and as is just getting an opportunity to take time out, out of training uh, and broaden your horizons and broaden your, broaden your perspectives and, and your experiences. So a PhD will offer all of these things um, and um, you stand to reap a, a, a real, uh, you know, lots of rewards from doing a PhD. Uh, and it's something that I would definitely uh, encourage people to think about, whatever their speciality may be. Um, so I may or may not have convinced some of you uh, that a PhD is what you want. Uh, so you, so for those of you who've, uh, who've been convinced, you're now committed. How on earth do you go about doing a PhD? Well, uh, to keep it really simple, because um, simple is always best, you really need five key ingredients. You need, a mot you need to be motivated and uh, enthusiastic yourself and uh, be prepared to, to put in the time and the hard work. Uh, so you're, you're, you know, that's where it starts from you. Uh, but then the next key critical step is finding a supervisor, someone uh, who uh, will supervise your PhD, who will, who will be there from start to finish and be uh, your contact person in uh, leading your research. Uh, and finding a good supervisor is really the make or break uh, for your PhD. If you find someone, you know, you need somebody who is very capable, of course, you need somebody with a track record of research, you need somebody uh, who has published before, who's supervised other students before. Um, and very important, you also need someone who uh, is someone you're going to be able to get along with. There's no point uh, 
you know, finding a very eminent supervisor who's also uh, supervising 30 other PhD students, that's not going to be ideal for you. You want someone who has got the time spending with you, whose personality uh, uh, will be one that you can work with. And you also will need an institution. So your super, you may have the best supervisor in the world, but if their institute is somewhere uh, very far away, somewhere where your research is going to be difficult, uh, or uh, it's, a, it's an institution that can't support your research, then it's really no good. So for example, if, you, you know, if your interest is in uh, mental health and you, you want to do research into uh, uh, psychosis in ethnic minorities, there's really no point looking you know, for a, a supervisor in an institute up in Aberdeen in Scotland somewhere. That's probably not going to be the best place for you and your research. So good supervisor, appropriate institute, um, and uh, a good project, a project that you're going to be invested in, a project that has legs, uh, a project that's worth doing. So one that will provide, you know, one that will uh, garner new research, uh, research that is going to be of value. And, and the final ingredient, uh, and in some cases, the key ingredient is funding. Uh, you need funding for your salary, you need funding for your project. Um, and I'll put a little star next to funding, but also I was hoping to put one next to a project, is that sometimes you may be lucky and have a project already in place that you really like. You may have funding already in place. Um, and you know there are opportunities like that where you can uh, uh, just find your supervisor in your place of, uh, a place of doing research and just uh, uh, get on with a PhD. But those are rare. Uh, and of course, you're, you, you won't have much say in your project. So your project will be ready-made. So you just need to bear that in mind. So, uh, you know why you want to do a PhD, you're, setting, you're set with that, you're happy with that, you know how to go about uh, preparing or planning your PhD. Um, and the next question is, when should you do it? Well, to be honest, there is no perfect time. Uh, you can go into, you can start a PhD from graduation up until you, you finish your training as a consultant. So anytime during that period, you're free to go out and do a PhD. Most people, uh, generally do it between uh, their middle grade years and their registrar years. And if you're on the integrated clinical academic training pathway, so if you've done an academic foundation program and an academic clinical fellowship, then you, know, you will have had lots of training in, in, in academia and how to go about uh, doing a PhD. And there'll be, very, there'll be a very clear exit time for you to go out and do your PhD. Um, I would definitely encourage, if you are someone who wants to be a clinical scientist, somebody who uh, has long-term plans of being an academic, then you want to get onto the, uh, onto the pathway, the integrated pathway, and get onto an AFP and an AACF. Um, regardless of whether you go down that pathway or you just go into regular training and then go out to do a PhD, uh, you will need to apply for time out of research. So you'll need to, uh, you will need to go out the program for at least three years to do your PhD. So that's sort of the how, why, and when. Um, I'm just going to touch slightly, uh, just um, shortly on my, my specific journey. So I went to Leicester Medical School um, and I knew very early on that I had an interest in research and in academia. Uh, I uh, helped uh, set up the Leicester University Medical Research Society, which uh, I'm very pleased to see is still active and running. Um, I, at medical school, I, I presented posters and went to conferences and, uh, and even worked towards a publication. And I continued this during my foundation program. But I didn't apply for an academic foundation program post because um, I wasn't sure where, where I was heading. I wasn't sure, uh, you know, I didn't want to tie myself to a project in an AFP. Uh, in a speciality which I didn't particularly, which I wasn't going to go down. So I was hesitant. I didn't really, wasn't ready to go down that route at, at that time. And then I went on to do ACCS training, which is uh, acute care com common stem, so ITU anesthetics, acute medicine, uh, and lots of acute uh, medical speciality training. And once again, I didn't apply, by this stage, I knew I wanted to do cardiology, but I didn't apply for an academic post in cardiology, uh, partly because um, I wanted to get the best clinical training possible um, and uh, an ACF, you know, you have dedicated research time, which means less time for clinical training uh, and also less flexibility in your training posts. So you, they're paired up with specific posts. And 
so uh, what so i you know i didn't go down the acf route um and the other reason was that i knew that you know if i got into cardiology i would be i knew that clinical research was going to be part of my cardiology training so i knew that there would be plenty of time to go into research later on during my career so i did my ccs training and throughout my foundation program and throughout my ACS training, I made sure to continue activities in, in, in academic and research activities. So I presented posters, I worked on projects, I published a, 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 a few more times. So that was very important in my application because when I applied for cardiology, which is very, which of course is competitive, um, you know, I hadn't done a BSc, I hadn't done an AFP, I hadn't done ACF, but you know, I still was able to prove to them that I've done that I had very similar skills. So that's just a point that you don't need to be on this bandwagon of, of academic uh, training from the very beginning. You can go into it when you are when you're ready. Uh, so got into cardiology and during my early cardiology training, again, my focus was very much on I want to be the best clinician that I can be. Um, and I knew that I was going to go into research at the, you know, at, um, when the time was right. Uh, and of course, um, the other thing that was keeping me busy was I was being a medical registrar. It's very difficult to try and do lots of research, to sort of worry about research when you're, when you've got a, a busy uh, clinical job. But I was starting to think about what areas I would want to do my PhD in, what areas I wanted to do my research in. So there are different branches of cardiology um, and um, I'd made up my mind after one or two years of training that I wanted to do my uh, research in cardiovascular imaging because cardiovascular imaging is increasingly uh, at the center of all of you know cardiology activities, whether it's diagnosis or management or you know uh, imaging is uh, becoming more and more advanced and it's becoming more and more integral to every decision that we're making in cardiology. So uh, I was now ready to start to look into where I wanted to do my research. Uh, so just to recap, I knew I wanted to do research from very early on, uh, but I, I was waiting for the right time. The right time was, was uh, starting to approach now during my early cardiology training. Um, and the next question that I had for myself was where and, uh, uh, you know, and, and how. So I started to do a bit of homework on the different centers uh, and the different supervisors that would that I, you know that I would be able to do my research with and of course being in North West London I was very lucky uh, there are uh, really world-class centers right at my doorstep uh, and I looked into a number of them and I approached six of them uh, so I emailed and this is really emailing you know emailing consultants and emailing uh, clinicians and researchers and and heads of departments and saying, look, you know, I'm interested, I'm a cardiology trainee, I'm a registrar, uh, these are my areas of interest, this is my CV, I, I really want to do some research with, with you guys, what do you have available, you know, what, and uh, what kind of projects um, can I uh, help uh, design and help work on? And um, I had several invitations to come and speak with them. I, in the end, I, I visited three different centers, uh, and the one that stood out um, was a group in Oxford, uh, the Oxford Cardiac MRI Centre there, uh, because they were, you know, they have world-class expertise, uh, they have a track record of, of producing uh, very strong uh, academic clinicians, and they were very nice, you know, it boils down to that. Uh, they were very nice and they were very happy to have me, um, and, you know, that was in some ways a difference, you know, how, how warm the environment is how well you think you can get on with your supervisors, your, your future supervisors. That that is a that is a very important. You can't underestimate how important that is. So we worked on a project uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, novel MRI biomarkers, cardiac MRI biomarkers. So we worked on this project, and then we started to look for funding because this wasn't a ready-made project. So there was no ready-made funding. So we looked around for for funding bodies and. Uh, there are four main players in, in cardiovascular research in the UK, the British Heart Foundation, the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust and NIHR. So we applied for the British Heart Foundation. Um, I think we started, we started working on our application uh, in November 20, uh, November in, in September 2019. And we finished 
our application, sort of preparing our application in February 2020. So it took us a good five or six months to just prepare the application. And then it takes another six months for them to give you a response back. Uh, so, you, so funding, applying for funding is a, takes a long time and is uh, often the key uh, sort of uh, uh, time limiting factor in when you go out for research. And of course, as a clinician, as a trainee, uh, you're going to have to tell the deanery when, to, when you want to go out for research. You know you only have about three years that you have to go out to program. So making sure that you, you know that you inform the deanery on time and that you plan it well and make sure that your funding starts when you research when you go out as soon as you go out to research uh, out to program, that is going to be very complicated to organise. Uh, so it's very important that you start early and that you're very clear with your super, your future supervisor, but also with your training program director, especially because funding uh, applications, particularly with BHF are uh, rarely successful at the first attempt. They only uh, accept 20% of, of applications uh, on the first, at the first go. And uh, as my application, uh, after submitting my application, I informed my program director that I wanted to go out for research. I gave him, uh, I gave him a, a, a time that I wanted to go out. I said uh, October, uh, October to December. Um, and I also had to apply simultaneously for uh, a PhD post at the university and at, at Oxford, uh, there is a separate interview process, which uh, I was uh, uh, not incredibly excited about having to go through, uh, but that went, that, that was, I was successful in, in getting a PhD post. So um, you can imagine that, you know, in a busy training job, having to organize, uh, go, you know, prepare an application, uh, organize the application and uh, submitting the application, uh, organize your time out the program and applying for that. This is, you know, preparing for a PhD is a one, one to one to one and a half year uh, period of preparing, uh, requires a, a one, one to one and a half year uh, period of preparing and a lot of hard work and time. Uh, and currently I'm waiting to get confirmation on my funding uh, I also made sure that I have uh, a second line of funding arranged so I can go out if the BHF submission doesn't come through. Um, but the aim for me, well, my aim is to go out of uh, program in early 2021. So I've had to delay things because of uh, COVID and, and BHF uh, has had to slash their funding by 50% uh, because of COVID. So to conclude, um, if you're thinking of a PhD, um, Try and decide as early as you can, because the earlier you decide, the better you can plan the when, the where, and the how. Uh, make sure that you, you don't have to start off in an academic pathway from the very beginning, but make sure that you keep up your clinical, but also your academic and research skills. So by presenting, by, you know, by doing projects, by going to research courses, keep up the skill and keep, keep your CV and your portfolio up. Uh, when the time comes for you to start to look for projects and supervisors and places and universities, shop around. Don't be shy to ask to approach five, six, seven different places and find the best uh, fit for you. And uh, when you when you uh, decide on a supervisor and a project, make sure that you plan your application and uh, plan your funding uh, as early as possible with your supervisor so that there aren't any issues with your with timing and training. And that's the end of my talk. So uh, I would definitely encourage people to think about going out to do a PhD. I think, you know, you have, uh, once you qualify in your chosen speciality within, within medicine, you have another four to five decades of work. So there'll, you know, three years isn't, isn't a very long time. And in the three years that you do a PhD, uh, there'll be many things that you'll gain um, that'll be useful not only for, for your career, but also just in life as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashkir. That was really informative, really insightful. And it's great that you gave us a timeline on what exactly is needed to pursue a PhD. We truly wish you the best in your journey. So we do actually have a couple of questions. Just give me one moment so I can access them in the chat box.
Can we do this one first? Okay, the first one we've actually got through Twitter is for Dr. Lynn. So that's, did Leicester Medical University allow for you to start the medical degree at a later stage because you were already in the PhD programme or, oh no, you had completed your PhD programme. Oh, um, Dr. Lynn, you're muted. Sorry, that's a good question. Um, so obviously for going into medicine as a graduate, you have the four year course um, and the five year course. So going in as a PhD, um, Lester don't do the um, the four year course. Um, but I didn't want to do um, a four year course because it was overall cheaper for me to do a five year course because I had some money saved up and it meant I didn't have to take extra loans. And also because I was continuing my, my research, I needed a little bit of space uh, to be able to still go back to Cambridge when I needed to. And that's quite difficult to do um, on, on the four year courses. So if you have a degree, yes, you can, um, sort of save a year but you would need to apply for a four-year course um, for that and go through graduate entry graduate entry medicine um, so yeah um, this one is um, for everyone you all mentioned networking how do you feel is the how do you guys feel is the best way to go about uh, Dr. Zakaria you can start um, don't be shy don't be shy. I think it starts really at, at medical school um, um, or wherever you're, you know, wherever you start your journey, whether that's, at, um, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a sciences degree, you want to make sure that you uh, speak to people, that you take advantage of opportunities, um, that you um, take advantage of, um, you know, and that you, and I think the other thing is that I find often is that if you don't ask, you don't get if you don't go out to your way to, um, so if I give you an example, when I it, literally to get my research, you know, I've spent what, a year and a half preparing and I hopefully go out to do research at Oxford in the coming months, but it all started with an email that I sent randomly at about 11 PM at night to a head of, to the head of the MRI department there. I'd never met the man. Um, and, you know, I just decided because, you know, the, the, I wasn't getting the answers that I wanted. I wasn't really get, I wasn't happy with the other opportunities that I had. So I just said, okay, why don't I just email? Where's the next space I can do uh, world-class MRI research? Okay, so why don't I just send an email? So I just sent an email and I got an email back and the, the email was come up and see us. Um, so if I hadn't decided to just put out the email, then I would never have had the opportunity. So don't be shy. I think it's probably the, the thing I would say. Don't be shy. Take advantage of opportunities and uh, um, and uh, make sure that you uh, um, ask questions and, and approach people. That's brilliant. Um, Dr. Faisal, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I uh, completely agree with Dr. Zakaria. Um, I would say, like, firstly, you have to sort of be willing to put yourself out there, as you said. Um, and that sort of creates more surface area for good things to come your way. Um, and also I would say that you have to be able to say no to bad opportunities because not every opportunity is, you know, a good opportunity. And so that's like step two. And step three is when you see a good opportunity, number one, grab it. And number three, learn to hold on to it. So if that means, you know, going above and uh, beyond for a supervisor to show that, you know, you're really keen and you want to work with them again, do it. Um, but I think most students, especially medical students, myself included, fell short at the first stage, which is to actually just go out there there's nothing to lose i mean you're, you're basically working for free um you can you know you should you should have the confidence to actually go up to anyone you want and just say look this is what i want um is it possible for me to have it this way um i'm willing to you know put the work in and effort etc and w w when you lay the groundwork like that essentially you know um you're either going to get a no which is fine you just move on to the next one or you say you get a yes um and so yeah i would say those main three points basically Okay, cool. And Dr. Lynn, anything from you? Yeah, I'll just say, um, make sure you go to conferences. Um, so when I was a PhD student and in, in research, conferences for us were really expensive because usually we were either a keynote speaker or doing an oral presentation or doing quite a big presentation. And I've gone into medicine and I'm quite amazed by how many free conferences there are um, from smaller smaller conferences run by student-led societies right up to conferences being hosted by the royal colleges so 
as researchers, the primary way we we network is to go to conferences and to stay behind. Obviously, it's going to be a bit different um, during COVID, but there are still loads of online conferences that are going that are going on. So I would really encourage you that if you have a specialty that you're interested in or an area of research that you're interested in, and your university research society is hosting an annual conference, please make sure you go along. There's going to be researchers and doctors there who are happy to speak to students who are interested in clinical academia. And then the second thing is the conferences hosted by the Royal Colleges, please go along. Um, you're going to meet lots of people, even me, despite being in research, I go to all the student conferences um, and have met a lot of people there. So go, go to the conferences and find find the spaces where researchers are. Okay, cool. That was some great advice. Um, we've also got another quite general question, so maybe all three of you could answer it again. How much time should, how much time do you need to spend on research whilst in medical school? Zach, do you want to go first again? <laughs> well, it's, it's um, you know, I think in general, doing an integrated BSc is, is a good idea. So that, that's where people, I guess, do most of their research uh, or research activity during their BSc. Uh, I would recommend that, despite me, not myself, not doing one, but um, it is definitely uh, useful because you'll get a, a good idea whether academia is something that you're interested in. And you get some of the basic groundings um, in in uh, being an academic, uh, being a scientist, and uh, beyond that, I think, you know, I would certainly I would expect if you're at medical school for you to get involved in one or two projects. Uh, I think that's definitely something that me most medical students should be able to uh, do. Um, but it's not, it shouldn't be your make or break. You know, you shouldn't be trying to spend all of your time at a medical school trying to get research and trying to get a publication. I think a publication is a nice bonus. I don't think anybody really expects medical students to have a publication despite what, despite the, um, uh, often, you know, there is a perception that you should have published it, you know, especially here in London. I think I, I see lots of students sort of concerned about that. I don't think that's, the, I don't think that's really necessary. As I, I was hoping to demonstrate, uh, you know, I myself am a bit of a late bloomer when it comes to academic medicine. You know, you can start later. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of discount, I wouldn't discount yourself if you haven't really got much research under your belt at medical school. I know you mentioned about an integrated degree already. So yeah, I, I, just, I just touched on it, but um, yeah, I definitely agree. So I did the integrated BSc and that was probably the the best thing I could have done for my research sort of career, as you would say, because before that I had done three years of medical school and I basically had nothing to my name. I hadn't really gotten involved in research besides, you know, the projects that were coming my way, which were allocated to me. I didn't, in fact, I didn't even know how to properly reference. I, I, I was, you know, um, I didn't have reference software. I, I, I basically didn't know what I was doing, essentially. Um, at the time, I wanted to be a surgeon, so I applied for, I, I went for the BSc, full well knowing that that would be a good year for me to get involved in research and actually to bulk up my portfolio, because uh, as most people know, surgery is very competitive and everyone's basically trying to get uh, publications and things. And um, so, yeah, during that BSc year, just being introduced, just ha not having to worry about the clinical commitment and just focusing on a couple of projects, which I went in and I said to the supervisor from the beginning, I'm like, look, I want to get published. This is my aim. The f a first class or, you know, second class, it it's not my main objective in this year. It's I want to get this published. So I was really keen on that. Um, some of those projects, you know, I, like one project was a systematic review, which we had to do from scratch you learn so much from having to do a good project with a good supervisor uh, independently and you just get thrown in the deep end so you learn a lot which means that you can reap rewards later on um i would also say that like if you're not going to do a bsc um um i would also say that don't 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 think too much about academia if number one it's not what you really want to do and number two if it's going to compromise on your clinical sort of time um i, I would say like even when i was applying for the academic foundation program the biggest criteria they look for when they interview you is that are you clinically sound because that's much more important than whether or not you're good at academia um if you do have some time doing summer holidays i would say a lot of medical students have a couple months off in between year groups uh, so if you want you can maybe reach out to someone you'll have a lot more time there but um i think each to their own however much time you can allocate to research while feeling comfortable um is is just down to you to be honest okay cool 
There were some good points there, so thank you for that. Um, Vasilin, do you want to add anything on as well? Um, not too much, because I think my perspective is going to be different because I've continued from what I was doing before. So my research involvement is a bit intense, but that's normal for me. I think something that has been pointed that I'll just say is that academia in medicine uh, is really varied. So it's not like what I know of academia, which is like you've got to have you know a big publication in, in nature and have lots of post presentations and be going for a big postdoc. In medicine, there's, being an academic means so many different things. It's from somebody who's on an AFP, ACF pathway and doing a PhD right up to somebody who actually is just involved in a project and isn't actually got a BSc or an MSc so I'll just encourage the med students that you really can uh, you know make the career that works for you you don't have to be doing you know above and beyond and publishing 10 papers if that's what you need and you need it for your specialty and you're passionate about med, uh, you know academia that much then please go ahead and do it but then you can still be an academic and have one paper or no papers and still be part of a lab so I just hope that you just you know enjoy that freedom that academia is very fluid uh, in, in medicine in comparison to what, what I know so you can really um, do as little um, or as much as you're interested in uh, but make sure you know what special if you know what specialty you're going into and you know it's competitive then of course you know what to do so bear that in mind. Well, I definitely would echo all, all of what Faisal and Lynn said there's always opportunity to get into academia to do uh, academic activities yeah always. there's mm -hmm. always going to be time I mean I'm aware of a consultant of 20 plus years who's also starting a PhD yeah. uh, in my department. So, you know, it's, it's, there's always going to be an opportunity. You just need to make sure you're, you, have, you know, you know why you want to do it uh, with who uh, and, you know, and in what area, but, or research in general, not just a PhD, of course. That's yeah. very comforting to hear. Um, uh, moving on to our last question. Yeah. Um, so um, for I think this one's more specific for Dr. Faisal and Dr. Lin. And um, what did you guys want to specialize in? I'll let Lin go first. OK, so um, oncology. So I, I don't even think I've really had to think very deep about this or, you know, speak to many people. Uh, oncology is what I know. Most of my colleagues were my, my PhD was very sort of translational. So most of my colleagues were oncologists or um, neurosurgeons in, you know, spe specializing in neuro-oncology or radiologists with a focus on oncology. So that's sort of what I'm I'm gearing towards. I'm not sure whether sort of pediatric oncology or um, adult oncology, uh, but there's going to be an O and an N and a C in there somewhere. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be leaving that area. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, we look forward to hearing about your journey. And we <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yep. um, Dr. Faisal, about you? So my journey was a bit more like up and down. Um, first few years, didn't really know what I wanted to do. In my third year, after watching like my first few surgeries, I was like, you know, I always had it in the back of my mind. I'd love to be, you know, get hands on. I'd, I'd always loved anatomy, loved the perf like the perfectionism in surgery, playing around with tech and things. So I wanted to be a surgeon. That sort of changed just before I graduated, just because... Um, I had sort of involved myself in a few like entrepreneurial sort of activities and I was like wait a minute I kind of like enjoy this as well and I started to give it you know a much more deeper think um, because I think as a medical student I would um, a lot of us we never really allocate the appropriate amount of time to really explore different fields um, I mean if you ask any F1 F2 half of them still don't know what they want to do and um I came towards the end of medical school, I just sort of, um, I, s I had a sit down and I said, you know, what's realistic in, in a few years time? What, what do I really want to go for? What will allow me to juggle other things that I want to do in my life? And so now I'm kind of set on a GP with special interests. Um, so I want to, I'm really interested in medical, edu in medical education and pediatrics. Uh, so those are hopefully will be my special interests in GP. But at the same time, I think, um, there's always time to change. And even if I were to go through the GP program and change my mind afterwards, I'd, I'd be open to going to a different career. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a, a bit of a journey for me. Yeah, that's, that was really interesting. And I feel like I can relate on that front that every day it's changing. As I do each new discipline, I'm like, yes, I want to do this. Now at the moment, it's pediatric. <laughs> so we'll see what it is tomorrow. So. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, I think that's it for the Q&A uh, section.
what we want to focus on now is telling our participants and you guys a little bit about the PhD Insight Days. So maybe one I'll let you take over. So um, we have an annual PhD Insight Day that is set to happen sometime early, uh, early to mid-November. Uh, and it consists of a series of talks given by current and ex-PhD students. And in addition to covering the basics of applying for a PhD program, we'll also be hosting a mini research symposium um, showcasing cutting edge research that is being carried out by the Somali community. And our aim is to instill a sense of familiarity and confidence into prospective students by giving them the necessary tools required for a successful application. And we are also accepting abstract submissions for individual uh, presentations from current students. So if you want, you can send your abstracts to smlacademics at gmail.com by the 31st of October. And we would like to thank again our speakers for joining us today and uh, the participants for participating. And uh, yeah, so thank you guys so much. It was very, um, it was very insightful. Thank you.